Welcome to Strange Weekly News. In this show, we'll take a look into the news and headlines, pick out curious reports of the strange, the weird, and the mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. Each news item we go over in the show, I will place all the links to them in the description box below once this live show is over, as well as chapters on the timeline index. Hello and welcome to all of my first-time viewers and listeners and everyone watching this live. Please show your support for my work by hitting that like button for this video make sure to subscribe and also hit the notification bell as i do three live shows right here on this channel covering topics of ufos the paranormal and things that are unexplained also on this channel i do post youtube shorts keeping you up to date on the latest strange news and if you're listening to this on a podcast platform write a review but do, do some stars, see what you think about it. I'd love to hear your feedback. So there's some pretty interesting stuff to cover. The biggest bombshell, of course, is the Aero UAP report that was released October 17th. And I didn't know about this until yesterday. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. It was dropped and no one said anything. I was in the dark here. I wasn't even given like a little tip off being like, oh, there's a report that's going to be coming soon. Keep an eye out. I was given none of that. Like our other reports where we kind of hear people coming forward and saying, okay, you're going to be getting a report during this time frame. Keep an eye out. Not this time around. And like every report that we have received thus far, you're going to have those that saw it in a positive light, those that saw it in a negative light. And uh, I'll just say here for this particular report, there's a lot of words, just like with the last one, that don't say much. But there are a, th a few things that we do need to grab from this. So I'm going to share my screen here because it's it's interesting in, in certain aspects of it. So... As you know, right, Arrow is a UFO investigations office that is run by the Pentagon. And in this particular report here, they looked at 291 UFO cases to look at over like this year alone. And some of these seemingly advanced craft appear to exhibit concerning performance characteristics, as it says in the paperwork, including high speed travel and unusual maneuverability, which we have heard time and time again. This is really nothing new here. And when we're looking at these reports, it just seems as if they are regurgitating the same kind of information. The nice thing about this particular report that we just received again, October 17th, is that we got some nice graphs. We, we got we got some things to please the eyeballs. Or as John Greenwald Jr. said in his review on it, eye candy. And he goes into great detail on that. I do recommend that you do watch that on the Black Vault. But what's what I want to bring to this is 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 going into like the key takeaways from this, because, yes, it's 16 pages of those 16 pages, maybe like 11 of them are valuable. And even that you're you're really stretching it. But more so when you're looking at this report here, you see that there are sheets that it's like it's like a half a page and then it goes into the next page as if just like with the last report that we received there is a page requirement there is a word requirement therefore they are just adding all this gobbledygook just to make the best of it and it's very disheartening for the majority of people and people have made this very clear those that have been researching this for some time, looking at other types of government reports and stating they really just want to discourage you by stating, oh, we have everything figured out. It's definitely not aliens. Go about your day and, and continue doing your nine to five job and never think about UFOs again. That's kind of the take that some people are getting when they read this recent report. And I don't necessarily disagree with them. But when you are reading a little more in between the lines, or if you have a more keen eye on what to look for, you are able to distinguish that there are there's certain information that is pretty interesting here. One of them being, and again, I have to, it actually says it here in the report, that for this year, they Aero was in collaboration with the Space Force. And this is a really interesting, I would say, like, partnership. Why? Well, Space Force, I mean, it's in the name, meaning that they might 
in these 291 reports, maybe they're not looking just at like things that are happening in our airspace, right? Just right here, very close to Earth, but maybe certain things in space as well which is, I think, is a very, very cool step forward. And they are in, Aero is in collaboration with a lot more departments than, than the year prior, which he did mention in the funding hearing that happened earlier this year with Gillibrand stating, oh, well, we need to kind of, we need to know what other departments are doing so that we're not collecting the same data, we're not repeating what they were doing, and so that we are in we are in the know of that if they are doing any like special special secret programs that we're not going to say oh it's definitely aliens when in reality it might not be people were listening to him when he was saying that during that hearing during that funding hearing earlier this year and so it seems as if they were like okay i i hear you on this sounds good let's put in all let, let, let's just make a pool of information and then you can decipher it right but here's another thing that we have heard time and time again since Arrow was released. And I would say even like the previous UFO offices, the UAPTF, things like that, is it's there's a lot of similarities to Project Blue Book. And very specifically in this particular report where they are stating, oh, yes, so it's it's balloons here. It's an aircraft there. Nothing really to see. It's definitely not aliens. It might be foreign adversaries, as we hear time and time again. But funny enough, in that report, it's saying, well, it might be foreign adversaries. None of the things that we have that were classified as a UFO are actually foreign adversaries. So I found that that aspect right there very, very positive. Why? Because people that are in this field they're very upset when they hear the threat narrative they're like oh threats there's blah, 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 blah. just like that right and i've i've given you my two cents on the threat narrative on if it wasn't a threat there wouldn't be funding for it but aside from that are they really threatening it depends who you ask it depends on people that have had experiences versus those that haven't right it just depends on the perspective but here the 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 narrative for a handful of years especially when we got those quote, Chinese spy balloons that flew over the United States earlier this year, that's a foreign adversary. I'm like, oh, it's super dangerous. But during this report, it seems as if all these 291 objects that were seen, none of them have any connection with foreign adversaries. So I found that aspect positive, but I feel like I'm a little bit more optimistic here. Could I be pessimistic? Yes, definitely. But I don't want to be like that. That that's that's not it's not really that great. <laughs> it's not good for your health either. Being optimistic is good, but you shouldn't be lying to yourself and stating, oh, well, everything's great and amazing when it might necessarily not be. But looking at this, continuing on forward, what was what was also very cool about this report is and I have an image here and I'm just, hold on. Let me see if I can find it. OK, well, I had an image and it disappeared, but it was a screenshot of this report showing a graph of the types of shapes that these objects kind of fall into the category of like orbs, um, orbs and spheres, right? Elongated. But what was interesting here is that 25% of the objects that were seen were orb, round and sphere, leaving 53% of sightings that did not report a shape. And I found that weird. I know other people did as well that read the report. John Greenwell Jr. is one of those people. He was stating, like, why? Like, what? Wh why? It's just the biggest question. Why even report that to begin with if you don't have an idea of what it is? And that should really pique a lot of people's interest. But when you're reading this 16-page report, really cutting it down, honestly, maybe like eight pages, maybe. Right? Um, is it? Is it? interesting should we even put any interest into that let me know in the live chat let me know in the comments as well because i do want to hear your feedback on this for those that have read the report or have already seen people's feedback on the report which funny enough this this came out october 17th okay three days ago and no one's been covering it until like a little bit of yesterday into today um news nation covered it cnn covered it um but aside from that no one no one's really touched it and i think it's because people didn't know it was coming out <laughs> i didn't know either until yesterday okay i was like whoa 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 
what's going on here? I was left in the dark. What the heck? And reading it, yeah, it's people are gonna say it's a nothing burger. And in some aspects, yeah, sure, it is. But it's nice that we're even receiving these reports. Um, but then like you can ask yourself, well, we're receiving them, they're not really saying anything. Is it just leading us on? And that's a great question. I think in some ways it might be. But in other ways, I feel as if, and I could be wrong here, and I want to hear your insights on this. It seems as if with the people, with really a public consensus saying, hey, we want these reports, you will give us these reports because you work for us. We're the ones paying you with our tax dollars, right? Is there that level of pressure there? Or are they kind of just laughing in the background stating <laughs> they think they're in power when in reality that <laughs> they're not and we're just giving them BS reports, right? I'm not sure here, but I'm trying to look at this from all different perspectives because when you are dealing with the government, uh, there's so many facets, there's so many layers, and they are playing 3D chess, which we don't even have here yet, unlike in Star Trek. But aside from that, it's it's uh, very difficult to read their minds on uh, why they're doing certain things, why some information comes out while others like while other information doesn't. And keep that in mind because we're actually going to touch on that in the next article I'm going to cover with you, because that's something that has bothered me for some time. Uh, going into this topic, researching it the last several years, it's why can some information come forward and others can't? Why are some people threatened when they have information while others aren't? Do you kind of see what I'm saying here? It's it's weird. It's very confusing. And that's what adds this level of divide, also this level of conspiracy in these topics. And a big reason to why people at least honestly, prior to 2017, they didn't take people that were in this topic seriously because they didn't have an understanding on how convoluted this entire phenomenon is and how difficult it is to follow and who to listen to and who not to, who's a disinformation agent and who isn't, right? It's it's very, very hard. And I'm never going to lie to you and say, oh, it's super easy. It's so it's so great. You're going to have a fantastic time. Uh, I hope you do. <laughs> it is very interesting, but it's not easy. No one said it was easy, unlike, I don't know, maybe sports. That's easier to follow, right? This this not so much, but it is very intriguing. It also I feel in my opinion here, it it it, it expands your mind, your imagination, your curiosity and to ask bigger and better questions. So there are many benefits to looking into this, looking at the world's biggest mysteries, but it, it can take a toll on the mind as well. If you want to see the whole detailed report on this, that link will be in the description box below. But you can also watch um, John Greenwald Jr.'s analysis on it on the Black Vault. But getting into our next topic, because we're still kind of on the same conversation of this, because Dr. James Lukatsky, and I'm pulling him up right now. Actually, let me just pull this up and then I'm going to read it because it's still on the same kind of thought process that I'm sharing with you. So let's pull this up. Here he is. Dr. James Lukaski, who headed a prior U.S. government investigation into UAP, affirmed that the U.S. government possesses a craft of unknown origin and it has access to its interior. And this was reported by the Libertarian Times. So a newly released book co-authored by Lukaski, this person that we're seeing right here, who led... OSAP, the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program, dedicated to the study of UAP, reveals more details about his tenure with the ATIP and the experience and the evidence he gathered that supports the existence of extraterrestrial technology. Okay, so that's a mouthful, and that's very, very intriguing for the majority of people. They're like, whoa, this person's coming forward. Is this like another whistleblower? What's going on here? All right, back it up just a little bit. Why? Because when it came to whistleblower David Grush, right, I was able to get a better understanding on how certain things work and how certain people are able to come forward with certain information or writing paperwork or writing books, right? Um, because if you have ever worked for the government and if you are to write a book, you have to go through the process through DOPSER, which is the Defense Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review. And all they're looking for, they're not fact-checking your information, but they are 
are looking for on if you are declassifying any information that is classified. That is what they're looking for. And in this case, for Lekatsky here, he he just had he just released a book uh, that he co-authored, and he is providing certain information. But that book had to go through Dopser before it was able to be published. And this is where my question lies. All right. Now, just, just keep on keep on following me, because how come some people can come forward? No issues. They can share certain information. It's not a big deal. While others can't. Why are some scared and others aren't? Is this, is this book that he had just released, does it actually have real information? Or is it just kind of some gobbledygook here? And Dobster's like, well, nothing's he's not sharing anything classified, so everything is A-OK, -okay, right? Is he sharing information that we haven't heard before? Do you see where I'm going with this? Are, are you following my thought process here? Am I being a little pessimistic? Yes, a little bit, definitely. But these are very serious questions that I have, and I know that many of you have as well, because we need to be skeptical. We need to not believe everything that we read and hear, but to use critical thinking. And yes, I am aware critical thinking doesn't grow on everyone's garden. I know. I see it, honestly, on a daily basis. I do. But... For those that are listening to this, those that are watching this, I know, I know you have critical thinking. So maybe you can understand or maybe provide answers to these questions that I'm asking. Because we don't know. I, I would like to know. <laughs> but it's weird. And that's one that I, I really wanted to bring up. And so Lekansky said that the U.S. government has in its possession a craft that is not made by humans and that, ha and that has been studying its structure and functions. He says, we don't have a craft that is not ours, that is not made by us. Oh, sorry. We do have a craft. Excuse me that is not ours and not made by us, that we have been able to recover. We have been able to get access to the interior of this craft, and we have been able to learn some things about it. Now, he did not specify where or when the craft was recovered or what it looked like, because that's probably classified, right? But he, he also did not disclose what kind of information the government has learned about it or whether it's still operational. He said that he is bound by a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA, and that revealing too much could compromise national security, which that's, see, there's the fear factor there. When you encroach an NDA, prison, quick and fast, like no question there. So that means that his book had to be heavily looked into, scrutinized, really dissected to see if there's any information that came out. Now, let's just keep on following me. Maybe. Just maybe if Grush never came forward, would have Lukatsky followed in his footsteps? Would he have published this book? Right? Because obviously he's, a, he's able to say that much that they have craft, recovered it. They're looking into it. He saw the interior, kind of like Bob Lazar. I'm, I'm kind of feeling the same kind of vibes here. But if Grush never said those things originally to News Nation earlier this year, would have Lekatsky done the same? I don't know. I have no idea. And Tasaka, thank you so much for supporting the channel. If you are enjoying this conversation so far, hit that like button. It lets me know that you're enjoying the show. And it tells the YouTube algorithm, hey, we want more content like this. Which is perfect. <laughs> it's really good. So in this... He did hint that the craft exhibits some of the same characteristics that have been observed in other UFO sightings reported to ATIP, such as hypersonic speed, extreme maneuverability, and anti-gravity propulsion, which is what we all are fascinated in, is that anti-gravity propulsion there. But he also asserted that there is no reason for humanity to fear potential non-human intelligence. Interesting that he used the term non-human. Per... Uh, provided that the human species could discover better and more full capabilities. He says here, if full human capabilities were known to us right now, it is not something that we need to fear. Going back just a little bit, non-human, right? That can mean anything. Um, but people have kind of come to a 
idea, a theory that maybe that when they were referring, like when Grush was referring to non-human biologics or non-human intelligence, um, all of this fun stuff, right? Non-human, while well, yes, we can say yes, cows, dogs, cats, oh, ha, ha, funny jokes. What if it could also be referring to AI, right? Why can't extraterrestrials be using AI technology like we are using now, using probes and rovers like what we are doing to Mars, right? And that we want to do in other planets and other moons, right? We, If these entities are so much more advanced, why would they send themselves? No, they would send AI. That would be smart. And that would be in the category of non-human, wouldn't it? Yes, it could. Now, of course, you can say all these other things like plants and cows and cats. Yeah, sure. Definitely. 100%. But if we're using critical thinking here, what if it's also referring to AI? Which we have covered so much on Strange Weekly News. I have come, I have thoroughly come to enjoy covering AI stories, AI advancements. Well, yes, it can be a little freaky. Definitely. It's also very cool to see it in real time, to see the advancements happen right before our eyes in a very short period of time. Who knows what's going to be happening next? Lukatsky said that he left the Pentagon because of the lackluster official response to ATIP's findings and their unwillingness to address potential risks from UFOs. So we're getting we're getting a lot here. He's saying, look, there's no need to be fearful on this, but there are still potential risks when it comes to UFOs. So we're getting a mixed bag here. We're getting a lot of different colored marbles here, but it is truly fascinating for another person to come forward and to share his information. Very specifically, someone with his credentials, who worked with OSAP, who worked alongside ATIP, right? I think this is very cool that he is coming forward and talking about this and writing it in a book as well. So, yes. Purple says the Borg. I hope we don't get there. I hope at least not anytime soon. But is it inevitable? Yes. Yes, it seems that way. It's a bit spooky. But this article goes into more detail, and, and please share your thoughts on this in the comments, in the live chat. I do thoroughly enjoy reading what you have to say about these things because it is very interesting. But the big question is, where does it leave us? I mean, everything here is anecdotal, and a lot of this to invest in takes belief right? We are left with more questions than answers. And that is the repeating factor. The smoking gun really isn't smoking at all <laughs> until full on definitive proof becomes transparent for the public to see. Do you see what I'm saying here? And I'm just going to go back to this to this image here of Mr. Lukatsky, because these are very valuable questions that we need to be asking ourselves. OK, and so some will take the anecdotal accounts almost religiously. But I for myself, I recommend a healthy dose of both open mindedness and skepticism. Ask more questions. Try to find your own answers, but get a little disheartened. OK, when, when I like in my case, I, I get a little disheartened when I see many settling on the statements as a matter of fact, when it's in fact hyperbole and anecdotal. And that's when that just it bothers me a little bit. But sometimes it even seems heavily pushed to one direction. And I get suspicious that we're being distracted. So as I always say, and I'll always keep on saying is I'm on the fence. I keep watching. I, I'm reporting it to the best of my ability, but we need to have a skeptical mindset and definitely not believe everything that we are reading and that we are seeing with our own eyes that we have so much faith in. They could be lying to us too, don't you think? But now we're getting into some advancements here, getting into the science. And if you follow my YouTube shorts, you might be familiar with this particular one because th this one, this one like blew my socks off. I found this so stinking cool. So I'm going to share an image here of an amputee. But like the, the, these new science advancements are unbelievable because a 50 year old Swedish woman who lost her hand in a farming accident has been fitted with a cutting edge prosthetic 
that has changed her life. And so this bionic hand is based on revolutionary technology that connects directly to the user's bones, muscles, and nerves, creating a human-machine interface that allows AI to translate brain signals into precise yet simple movements. Are we getting to the cyborg era? Yes. Are, are the Borgs coming? <laughs> this kind of tech? Yes. But, 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 looking at this from the optimistic standpoint, this is revolutionary. This is immensely incredible. Because if you are an amputee or know anyone that is, the prosthetics that we have today, like our, our mundane ones, our quote affordable ones, but they're not affordable at all. They have people have complained that they're very uncomfortable. They don't really function that well. They don't really do anything except like maybe not scare kids, right? That's about it. Um, but with this, with this, this technology here that is being practically integrated into the bones, muscle, and nerves, and also using AI, it will be a functioning hand, like almost perfect. And in this case, for this particular one, it has a 95% success rate, which that's for science, for technology, that is exponential. That is incredible. Of course, you're going to have that 5, 10% error that's prevalent in any invention. But in this case, for it to be 95% accurate, that that's the success rate. They need to be passing these out to everyone who needs one. However, when I did post this short, I did read your comments on it and people were stating, yeah, this is super cool, but imagine how expensive it is. And you're absolutely right. We are not aware on how much this costs. No clue. Couldn't find it anywhere. But you can assume it's probably in the hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars easy when you are having to integrate it into practically into the nerves. Like, yeah, bone that's not too bad muscles that's not terrible but into the nerves that's where it's getting real tricky and you need very very specialized people in order to create and place these these prosthetics into a person right and does insurance even cover it i have <laughs> these are all very important questions are we going to see this succeed in the near future i really do hope so will that be the case when it comes to things like this, some of the most like amazing pieces of technology, it takes a very long time for it to be integrated. Okay, a great example, nothing to do with people per se, but like electric cars that took a very really long time, hydrogen cars that, that ran on, on uh, hydrogen, but also like, like your water cars, right? Solar panel cars. They have been being invented for decades, but if people aren't grabbing onto them. People aren't like, oh yeah, we should start selling these for real. Um, and you can have your own reasons on why you think that may be. But here looking at amputees, looking at these pro like this, this new technology is it the same kind of thing that maybe it's super awesome but it's not going to take off anytime soon no idea let me know in the live chat let me know in the comments right now i am drinking a sexy cup of orange juice because you know sometimes your immune system is like hey 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 get that vitamin c and you're like hey you're absolutely right Never go wrong with orange juice. It's so good, like all times of the day. To be fair, I don't drink it that often, but when I do, it means that I really need it. <clears throat> Here, she also mentions that and her name is Kareen or Karen, depending on how you want to say it. I don't know how they say it in Sweden, but she mentioned that compared to her old prosthetic, um, this one's a lot more comfortable and that she doesn't take as much medication as she did previously, which is very, very exciting. And the international team of engineers who worked on the bionic hand recently shared her success in the journal Science Robotics. And that's how we were able to get this information today. And these researchers come from Sweden, Italy, and Australia. That's a very fun combination and says it's the first time that a robotic hand with internal electrodes has shown long-term viability for amputations below the elbow. Super cool. There's another image here 
of how they're kind of able to do it. If I just zoom in here, right? Get the you get the nerves, you get the free muscle graft, right? You get where the 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 fake hand goes into the arm, right? This, this is very very cool. This is very exciting. I would say for as a science advancement, I think so. Are we behind? Oh yeah. For 2023, I expected flying cars, already installations on the moon with us traveling to the moon, right? Maybe like anti-aging pills by this time where you're always at the age of like, I don't know, 25, 30 tops, right? And yet we're still struggling with age here. I truly thought by this time we would have been that advanced, but here we are still struggling significantly. And it's very disappointing. It is. And I have a I have a lot of questions why. Because we had this exponential growth, I would say, in the 70s. Our technology was booming. It was insane. And then we hit the year 2000, and then bam, like stunted growth. Things just stopped. And we've been living in the dark ages of the year 2000 ever since. Maybe like the 90s. I mean, yes, our computers have gotten smaller and more slim and our, and our phones now fit in our pockets compared to, like, being stuck onto the wall. Yeah, sure, those are great. Ooh, awesome. Um, but not, it's really not that amazing compared to how quickly technology has advanced and then all of a sudden here we are with the same kind of phone style, right? These flat phones, the last 15, 10, 15 years or so. I need to complain. I need to complain to someone about this. Like, come on. <laughs> Get that technology up there. Yeah, Hellcat. I can't believe we're still using combustion energy. I know. Honestly, same. <laughs> For being 2023, I'm a bit disappointed. Bobby says, looks like a gun arm. That's pretty cool. I'm seeing the Borg here. Oh, it, it is to come. <laughs> There's no question there. Pretty freaky, actually. Resistance is futile, says Robert. Yes. Yes, it is. Exterminate. All right. That's done with those types of jokes. And this one also goes into significant detail on how they were able to create this, people that were involved, and how long it took to create something like this. But there was a really fantastic video, and I actually show it in the short that was released by Science Now. Was it? I believe so. Or Science Alert, excuse me. And they demonstrate how this bionic hand is able to do, like, simple tasks like zipping up a suitcase, mo like, putting coins into a cup, m holding squares, like, square objects. It's very, very cool because we take our limbs for granted. We take these hands for granted. We really, really do. Uh, me too. I, I do all the time. Every day. <laughs> I do. But when you no longer have it, you begin to realize like how much you used it. And that goes for anything. As the saying goes, you don't know what you had until you lost it. And while it's so cliche, if you've ever been in any kind of predicament like that, you feel that to heart. And you feel it in your gut. You're like, yeah, you know, you're absolutely right there. Because it hurts. It hurts when you lose something. And you're like, mm, I didn't know I lost it. I mean, I didn't know how much, how amazing it was until it was gone. It's true. It really is. Now we're getting into our kind of funny stuff here. Because this next one, I was laughing really hard at this article. And it, <laughs> it's not funny for the person. But it's funny for everyone that's reading or listening to this. So I'm going to share my screen here. This one's merely a visual aid. I've really come to enjoy creating AI art. It's been a lot of fun. I, um, I use it for a lot of my shows now. And it's it, you get to have a like, little creative flair when you're creating these. So according to reports, the strange turn of events occurred in the early hours of Sunday morning in a suburb of Waverly in New Zealand. <laughs> The driver, a 24-year-old man, had gotten himself into a spot of bother after observing what he believed to be a ghost that tried to flag him down for a ride from the other side of the road. Panicked by the presence of this supernatural hitchhiker, which we've covered before, he, he stopped his car, 
reversed up the road and then his car fell into a ditch and then it got stuck. It wasn't long before the police had arrived on the scene and according to Senior Sergeant Anthony Bond, this is where it gets really funny, the ghost that had left the man so spooked was in fact little more than a pedestrian who had been trying to flag down a passing car for a lift. <laughs> a breath test also revealed that the panicked driver had been under the influence of copious quantities of alcohol as well. But let me let me just back it up. This is this is very funny. Um, not for him. It's not funny for him at all. It's probably very devastating. But to everyone else, it's hilarious. Why? Because first of all, we have covered cases. I would I want to say it was on Mysteries with a History. There are universal stories of ghostly hitchhikers where you have these weird men and women that are standing on the side of the road, at least as the story goes, as these paranormal stories go, and they're flagging a car usually at night, and then the person would drive past this person, right, this ghosty person, and then only when they keep on driving, the ghost is still there asking for a ride. I think it was like the redhead hitchhiker. That's one in the United States where people have allegedly encountered this. And if you do, you know, you meet a pretty deathly fate. There are other instances where you are passing by a ghostly hitchhiker as the stories go allegedly and then all of a sudden you have these ghost hands on your car wheel that are trying to turn you all types of which ways and then you get really hurt or you die right no it's these are stories that have been prevalent in paranormal history for a handful of decades so if this this poor man is like familiar with these stories yeah he would have been very very spooked but in reality it was just like your average dude, your, your average hitchhiker, <laughs> just calling for a ride, and that's it. <laughs> but this man was so scared that his car got totaled. He drove into a ditch. That's terrifying. I knew someone when he was getting his like driver's license at the age of 16 or 15 or something, and he was with his whole family in the car, his like dad and his siblings, doing some like practice driving. He tells me the story many years ago. And something happened i'm not sure he got spooked or something and he drives the entire car with his family into a ditch luckily it wasn't like a super deep ditch or anything like that but they had to call a tow truck to get it pulled out and let's just say he didn't get his driver's license for many years after that but if this has ever happened to you it's very scary first of all ditches are ter ter terrifying all right, when you're driving or like you're on a very narrow road and you have a ditch right next to you and trying to be like really, really careful not to fall into it. I have that fear. I do. It's just me, though. But I feel very bad for this man and like his shock factor. But then again, he was under the influence, which is very devastating. And that's I would say it's illegal anywhere. You can't drink and drive. It's, no, it's not a thing anymore. It used to be, but not in 2023. So he's probably... Had a fine to pay, right? Probably was behind bars maybe for a day or so. Who knows? We don't have that information. But <laughs> I just think it's funny here that the first thought was a ghost when in reality it was just a guy. Just an average dude. <laughs> if you're enjoying these, these articles, hit that like button. Because <laughs> let me know your favorite one thus far, please. Okay, this next one. It's a uh, it's a bug story, and I know bugs aren't for everyone. We've covered like the 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 zombie parasite, the zombie fungus. And that one's pretty freaky. But there is this new one that was discovered. It's not a fungus. It's actually of a certain type of wasp. And I didn't want to show you like any scary pictures of wasps, so I literally typed in online. I'm like an anime wasp because anime is always cute, right? Most of the time. So I got an anime looking wasp here so that people's skin doesn't crawl too much and it doesn't look that bad because when I was scrolling through images to like, first of all, for this article, they shared images and they were they were gross. I like my skin was crawling. I felt real icky. And I said, no, start scrolling through online looking for a good picture. And my skin was just like <laughs> gross. And then I said, OK, I need to make this a better I need to get a better option, better scenario. So then I found this one. And this one really isn't that bad, but it shows that it's angry and it's flying super fast. Okay. So scientists in the Amazon, it's 
always the Amazon, have discovered a giant headed bright yellow wasp that, and this is the, this is the crazy part, okay, that stabs it, its hosts, sucks out its blood-like fluid before eating its hosts from the inside out. This was just newly discovered, guys. And I'm already like, first of all, perfect for the spooky season. But there are a handful of bugs that are like this, handful of parasites and fungus that are like this. But this one's new in this wasp family. So this newly found species, which was found in the National Reserve in Peru, is named Capito Joba Amazon Inca. Its genus name is a combination of Capito, a reference to its large bulbous head, and Joba because the new found wasp is similar to those of the genus Joba. So Brandon Claridge, a doctoral candidate in biology at Utah State University and colleagues, <clears throat> discovered the strange wasp species as part of a long-term surveying process in which they laid malaise traps, which is one of these, by the way, I had to look that up, which are these large tent-like structures that capture flying insects in the understory of the rainforest, usually flies. And the new wasp, which can grow up to 0.7 inches, 0.7 inches or 1.7 centimeters, centimeters, centimeters long, lays a single egg inside of the body of its host, which can be a caterpillar, a beetle, even spiders can fall prey to these very scary, honestly, parasites. So here's the crazy thing. Once the host is located and mounted, so if the wasp gets on, a, gets on a caterpillar or something, right? The female will frantically stroke it with her antenna. And if acceptable, the female will deposit a single egg inside the host by piercing it with her egg-laying organ, known as the ovipositor. And after just a few days, the egg will hatch and the newly hatched larvae will eat the host from the inside out. Who needs horror movies? Who needs scary movies when you can just go outside, okay? The animal kingdom is mortifying. These bugs right here need to go back into the whatever hell realm that they came from. And they need to stay there because, uh-uh, I never want to encounter something like that. I don't even want to see it with my own eyeballs. Hard pass. Really big one. But it's spooky. It's strange. It's strange news. So, of course, we're covering it. And so this this article actually in particular has been making its rounds across the media. A lot of articles are covering this. A lot of more like sciencey websites are covering this. And it's fascinating. It's so like it's so fascinating. It's the only word I can use. It's not cool. It's not great. It's just unbelievable, really. And so with this, with all of this, the after the larvae kind of eats the host right if it's in a like in a beetle for instance it's going to keep on growing but still in that protective shell right of the exoskeleton and until it like just emerges out of the skeleton like in the movie alien or something right and then it lives its its waspy life until it's like, like laying eggs all over again but it only lays one egg only one not multiple. It's almost as scary as, you know, like black widow spiders, right? Where the mom lays a bunch of eggs, lays one egg with like a bajillion spiders, and then all the spiders eat the mom. Yeah, it's just as scary as that. Maybe a little bit more. I don't want to spend too much time on that one because it is pretty spooky. Um, but it is just wild. And Cassidy, thank you so much for that super sticker. Hopefully this story is uh, is interesting here. But thank you for that. I always appreciate you supporting the channel all right but i don't want to spend too much time on that one because i know some people are going to be like this is too freaky i'm already seeing those uh in the live chat here but steven being an optimist is saying life is so awesome yes it is <laughs> hillbilly herb or herb depending on where you're from right lol good list idea Top 10 hell bugs. Yes. Cringe. Yeah. All freaky stuff. <laughs> and just newly found, too. 
this next one I think is very cool and it it led my mind going a certain way and I'm going to share that with you but first let's pull up this image of a very natural looking tree that looks very spooky why because it's the spooky season and I had never come across this tree before all right so this tree looks like it's bleeding blood like that's like red blood is just oozing out of this tree but in reality it's just a dark red sap that's natural when it comes to this particular tree known as the wild teak or bloodwood and it's a species of tree native to southern africa primarily known for the dark red sap it secretes which looks like blood when the tree is cut okay 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 Let's just back it up just, just a little bit here. Because this one, this is crazy. I have never seen this before in my life. But hey, nature never stops surprising me. Probably you either. But let's say you had no knowledge. No knowledge in a bleeding tree. All right? Let's just say that. And you cut a tree. And you have maybe a religious background. But let, let's go back 100 years. All right? You have a religious background. You cut a tree. It starts bleeding. Instantly, you're going to think this is a bad omen. I'm going to probably perish in a few days. This is terrible. And then you run for your life. But with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of understanding, you can think to yourself, actually, this is completely normal. Why am I breaking this up? Because this still happens today where we use, where we're, some of us are still kind of like superstitious in some instances or where we very quickly believe something when it has a pretty simple explanation to it, right? But when we use, again, that critical thinking, we can think to ourselves, maybe, just maybe it's not a bad omen. Maybe I will not perish in a few days. What if it's just natural? Now, to be 100% honest with you, if mine was casually cutting a tree, and it starts bleeding, the first thing that would come to mind is like the statue of one of the statues of like the Virgin Mary and her and she starts crying blood, but it's a statue. That would be my very first thought. And I know I'm not the only one here. And I would think to myself, what is going on? And then after freaking out just a little bit, then I would start attempting to do a very thorough investigation to get a better understanding on how this is happening. Of course, there can be instances like some of these statues that allegedly cry blood right you can think is there a paranormal aspect to it some are gonna say yes yeah sure could it be some are gonna hoax it and make a lot of money hoaxing you yes that's also a thing but if you're in the forest all by yourself hmm, and you're casually cutting a tree and it starts bleeding where would your mind go first what would you do would you go on your knees and start praying would you run as fast as you could would you look around or would you take a sample or all of the above at the exact same time. <laughs> Could you imagine on your knees and then like running really fast? Yeah, that'd be kind of hard. But hey, to each their own, right? But I found this really fascinating here. And this is a new article that was written by Oddity Central. I love that website. They have some really fantastic and very strange stories. I think I cover every single week. I, I, I at least use one of their articles every week to cover because they're just they're just one of those sites that keep you on your toes. They really do. So this is a pretty well-known tropical tree in Africa, which I don't know anything about, um, where this is actually used to make high-quality furniture and musical instruments because wild teak is resistant to termites and has a nice spicy fragrance. It's also resistant to fire, so trees are sometimes planted around structures that need to be protected from flames. Okay, so not only is this bad boy bleeding blood, say that three times fast but also it is fire resistant and it resists termites and it has a spicy smell to it what kind of tree is this it's a magical tree that's what it sounds like here but it's also crazy and outside of southern africa bloodwood is also known for its unique dark red sap its resemblance to blood has some people to speculate that the tree's magical healing powers in blood illnesses none of which have been proven by conventional medicine but people in and around that area use it in order to help with blood illnesses and backing up just a little bit here because our conventional medicine, it's a lot of like weird chemicals. It's, just, like, it's weird. But when you go to like the 
back to the roots, back to the basics of herbal medicine, that stuff works wonders. Does it do it all the time? No. No. Sometimes you really need to get a pack. Yes, you do. But in other instances, if you can go natural, that's going to be overall just more beneficial for the body. Many years ago, I suffered with like really, really bad acne. Uh, and I still get that. And I have like scars all over. Anyways, um, I actually went to an herbal medicine Chinese doctor and I said, please help me with this. And the first thing she checks is my pulse. And I'm like, whoa, what does my acne have to do with my pulse? And then she checks my tongue and I'm like, whoa, nothing to do with anything right but it does it does so when we go back to the basics of like basic understanding of the human anatomy using basic plant herbal medicine acupuncture right it's it's overall beneficial and then you can kind of compare it to your more conventional medicine right western medicine where there are a bit more complications I'm not saying do one or the other, but I find it interesting here that in this article, they are mentioning that people in Southern Africa that come across these trees, they use the tree sap and believe that it has magical healing powers uh, in order to help with blood illnesses, which is has to be one of the most difficult illnesses to heal or to fix or to cure when it comes to the blood. Okay. So looking at photos of cut trees, it's easy to see where the name Bloodwood comes from. As we're seeing here, I have another image, right? Look at this. This is, ter this is terrifying. <laughs> it is. If you have no idea what you're looking at. But once you get the gist, you're like, ah, easy stuff. Not so spooky. There's another one here. This one doesn't look as bad, doesn't look as red. But then you could also ask yourself, like, is it a murder scene? Right. Like, let's say you just casually walk by and it's like already a cut tree on the ground and you see blood all over it. You're like, yep, something happened. You run for your life. Yeah. Because you don't want to be next. Right. Cassidy says red amber. Yeah. Another good one. That's a pretty good one. Val says kind of makes sense. Nice. John bringing in the facts. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Chinese medicine those Cassidy. It's pretty good stuff. But what's also very cool about this before I um, finish this article, because we're going on tangents here, but hey, they're all decently relevant to this article, is that also this, while it's obviously not blood, it's, uh, it's a tannin rich sap and most plants have parts like leaves in particular that contain between 12 and 20 percent tannins in comparison to wood sap which has 77 percent so let's say that like your average plant right it has 12 20 percent of tan tannins tannins i believe how you say it if you were to just to amp that up a little bit would that mean that all plants are going to be just bleed in this kind of red blood. But if you were to cut any plant, back it up, right? It oozes. Is that not plant blood? Probably. Probably is. Depending on who you ask, really. <laughs> but with this, this wood has plenty of uses. But it's it's a it's a weird sap and it isn't useless either. Because apart from its conventional use in alternative medicine as a cure for various diseases of the blood, it can also be used as a dye. And some people mix it with animal fat to create a sort of cosmetic ointment. When you are left to your own devices, you can make anything work. And that's what I think is so stinking cool about humanity is that we are built to survive, but also we are built to be innovative. For the most part, we're we're decently good at that. I wouldn't say perfect. That's not true. But if if we are left to our own devices, like if you ever come across any stories where someone is abandoned in the forest or in the rainforest, have it because of like some horrendous thing happened to them, right? For whatever reason, they are able to just like keep on waiting until they receive help. They're able to somehow find water and use the things around them to help their wounds, even if they had no background in any kind of medicine of any sort or like any background information on how to survive in the wilderness. People, you're amazing. It's so stinking. I love it so much. I don't want to be in that predicament. Never. I'd like to have basic understanding before I go anywhere or do anything. But for the most part, people are decently innovative and they're pretty good at knowing how to survive. 
which I think is very cool. But that is it for today's show. Please let me know which article was your favorite and why. I'd love to hear the why aspect of it too. Follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news. I do want to say thank you to everyone watching this live, all the super chats, super stickers, YouTube members, Patreon supporters, and of course, all of my amazing moderators. You know, I simply cannot do this show without you. If you want to continue this conversation, bring it over to the Discord server with 2,000 other like-minded members. Share your thoughts, your insights, your experiences, and more. And I know I know that one of my amazing moderators will share that link in the live chat for you. Also, take a look at my Instagram where I share pictures and short videos. But if you are enjoying all the content that you are seeing right here on this channel, consider being a Patreon supporter where all the funding goes straight to the channel to Puck the Puck Wedgie for his bowls of ramen and to the RV fund, where I'll be traveling the United States, hitting all the UFO and paranormal hotspots, documenting it, and taking you on the journey with me. That is it for today. I will see you next time. Oh, but before we do that, Sasha, thank you so much for that. Your style and show are excellent. Very interesting, fun, and watchable, too. Thank you for that. That is too kind. And that was just a nice way to end the show. So that is it for today. I will see you next time. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies.